Uh, Daniel's going to kick it off for class, but we're going to try something new. So we don't have to repeat your question up here. I've got a mic up here. Raise your hand. I'll come to you, and we'll let you ask the question. That way it goes over the live stream a lot easier. Um, excuse me? Um, class started? <laughs> it's just my wife. She's back there having her own little conversation. But <clears throat> I'm always late. What's new? Anyways, so uh, Daniel's going to start it off. Um, so just raise your hand if you got a question. I'll come to you. All right. All right. So, um, so I figured out uh, pretty late into the process that I was going to be co-teaching the class today. Um, <laughs> so I don't have a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of things prepared. But what we are going to do is we're going to uh, watch some videos. A pretty similar setup to last week. Um, we've got some videos about uh, in the, the Wonders of Creation series from World Video Bible School. And uh, in between each one, we'll have a little, time for, a little time for comments. And then after we're done with those three different videos, um, Travis has uh, uh, some more things to say after that. Um, so let's start with the first video. First video is about giraffes. The height of an 18-foot giraffe, the tallest of all land animals today, is quite daunting. The clumsy-looking giraffe's ability to run more than 30 miles per hour is very impressive. Their ability to go weeks without drinking water, if necessary, is remarkable. Their 18-inch tongues, 8-foot long tails, and 6-foot tall newborns are all very striking. Perhaps most remarkable is the design of the giraffe's circulatory system. Consider that a giraffe's brain is about eight feet higher than its heart. So in order to get blood from its heart up to its brain, a giraffe must have an enormous heart that can pump blood extremely hard against gravity. What's more, it must maintain such blood pressure as long as the giraffe's neck is vertically in the air. It should come as no surprise that this long-necked mammal is equipped with a two-foot-long, 20-plus-pound, thick-walled heart that is large enough and strong enough to pump blood eight feet high, creating blood pressure that is about twice that of any other large land mammal and as much as three times that of the average person. But what about when a giraffe suddenly lowers its head several feet below its heart to get a drink of water? What happens to all of the blood that the heart normally pumps upward against gravity to the brain? If the design of the giraffe were merely left up to time, chance, and random mutations, what would you expect to happen the first time a giraffe tried to lower its neck to get a drink of water? It would seem the heart would pump so much blood to the brain that its blood vessels would explode or its brain would fill up with blood so quickly that the giraffe would pass out and perhaps soon be eaten by a lion or a crocodile. So how does the giraffe keep from having brain bleeds or from feeling woozy and passing out every time it bends down and raises back up? Giraffes are specially designed with intricate valves in their jugular veins. These valves help control how much blood gets to the brain during those times when the giraffe has its head lowered. Working together with these valves is a network of blood vessels known as the wonder net of the carotids which controls the blood flow into its head. Atheistic evolutionists admit that the giraffe has a complex pressure regulation system, unique valves that prevent overpressure when it lowers its head, a network of blood vessels that help stabilize the blood pressure as the giraffe moves its neck up and down, and a heart powerful enough to send an adequate amount of blood eight feet upwards against gravity. Evolutionists would have us believe that nature provided giraffes with all of this special equipment. But how do mindless, purposeless, random processes of time and chance adequately explain unique valves, a heart, lungs, and arteries all being just the right size, as well as a wonder net that keeps just the right constant blood pressure in the brain whether the giraffe's neck is raised or lowered? Even more difficult for evolution to explain is how all of these sophisticated body parts came about simultaneously. After all, what good is a big heart without a network of blood vessels that stabilizes blood pressure? 
And what is the point of the wonder net of the carotids if the giraffe did not have a heart powerful enough to pump blood eight feet into the air to begin with? Evolutionist Robert Wesson openly addressed this issue in his book, Beyond Natural Selection. He wrote, all these things had to be accomplished in step and they must have been done rapidly, that it could all have come about by synchronized random mutations strains the definition of random. The most critical question, however, is how the original impetus to giraffeness and a million other adaptations got started and acquired sufficient utility to have selective value. The observer must be often tempted to suppose that organisms have responded to their conditions and needs more purposefully than strict Darwinian theory can allow. The circulatory system of many animals, as well as mankind, is a fascinating study. The amazingly intricate design of the giraffe circulatory system, as well as the rest of its anatomy and physiology, demand a much better explanation than the random processes of evolution. In truth, the giraffe is brilliantly designed, a wonder of God's creation. I like that picture, that's, a, that's fun. Um, so I just have a couple of notes about, uh, about giraffes and uh, the, some of the stuff that he talked about. The, um, the, the phrase that he used, uh, the wonder net of carotids, was something that I'd never heard of before. And so I looked it up, it's, it's what is known, it's a, it's a Latin term called, and, and you'll have to excuse me if I'm not up on my Latin pronunciations, uh, this is called the Rete Mirabile, which translates to Wonderful Ned, which is nice. Um, it's, a, it's a series of, uh, a very complex series of arteries and veins that are that close to each other. It looks like a net, um, and it regulates blood flow in, uh, in mammals, <clears throat> um, regulates blood flow in a bunch of different areas of various mammals. Um, however, the one in, in giraffe's necks are particularly complex just because of how much neck there is to go around, you know? It's a, it's a really very, a very impressive thing. And, and it said to get, you know, from that on average, that eight foot distance between the heart and the brain, um, it, it's a truly impressive uh, series of veins, and, and he talked a little bit about the blood pressure in a giraffe. is fascinating. He said, uh, in the in the brain itself, the blood pressure is is a little bit lower than what would be considered normal for humans. the The normal blood pressure in a giraffe's brain, in most mammals, in most mammals' brains, is about one ten over seventy. Um, but close to the heart, in order to to be able to get it up to that pressure in the brain, uh, close to the heart, the blood pressure in a giraffe is about 220 over 180, which I'm glad mine's not quite that high. Um, <laughs> I, really, I really also appreciated the way that the video put it in that uh, it's, it stretches the definition of random uh, to think that all of this came about by chance. You know, uh, I, a lot of y'all know that I'm a high school math teacher um, in college, I was a math major, studied a lot of math and computer science, and we talk about that term random, you know, true randomness is, is something that, uh, that computers still can't achieve. There's always, you know, some, any, in any random, randomly computer generated thing, there's some pattern that was underlying to it. Um, true, true randomness, uh, you know, is, is something that can only come from intelligence. And when you look at, you know, it, stretching the definition of random, uh, you know, the idea of random mutation, that did a, you know, that word random did a lot of work in that phrase, <laughs> you know, to, to, to get to the point that, that an animal this tall would be able to regulate its own blood pressure and, uh, and have all of that amount of control is is just baffling that all of that could happen by chance. Uh, what comments? Yes, sir. Uh, Sarah and I always wondered about that. We, of course, we've seen so many comments, mm. and uh, the weirdest uh, with uh, Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and I'm glad that these guys have, uh, he, Gary said that, uh, you know, you, you see a giraffe and, and you wonder about these things, but uh, never really follow it up. Then you see a video like this, it's nice to actually have some, some people, uh, it's nice to have some people smarter than me who have investigated this sort of thing. <laughs> Any other uh, comments from the class? All right, uh, on our next animal that we're gonna be watching is a video about camels. Camels may live in some of the hottest places on earth, but they are some of the coolest and comical creatures that God created. Just one look at their skinny legs, knobby knees, wide feet, humped back, long neck, stretched face, bushy eyebrows, and big floppy lips, and you can't help but chuckle. Just be careful not to laugh at a camel too long. You might irritate him, and if you bother him too much, he might just bite, kick, or even spit at you. Well, it's not really saliva. Camels actually burp up partly digested food called cud and spray their agitators by flinging the greenish gunk from their floppy lips. You may not have to worry about this with well-trained camels, but if you agitate a crabby camel, watch out. Some camels have two humps and live mostly in Central Asia. The most common camel, however, is the one-hump Arabian camel. Have you ever heard that a camel can go long periods of time without drinking because he stores large amounts of water in his hump? It's true that a camel can go long periods of time, days or even months, without drinking water, but it doesn't store water in its hump. God made a camel with the ability to store fat in its hump. A healthy, well-fed camel can have a hump that weighs as much as 80 pounds. When a camel goes on a long journey, often carrying people or supplies, and food becomes scarce, he relies on stored fat for energy. The longer a camel goes without eating, the more stored fat he uses. At the same time, the hump gets smaller and smaller and often begins to hang off to one side. Later, when the camel is able to get his fill of food again, his hump begins to fill out and goes back to normal. How is it that a camel can go days or even months without a drink of water? What have scientists learned about the amazing design of this water-conserving creature? First, a camel can get a large amount of the water his body needs from the plants that he eats. This is especially true in the wintertime when plants hold more moisture than in the summer months. A camel can even get water from eating cacti without hurting his mouth. Can you imagine eating a cactus? A camel can consume such a prickly plant because of the very tough lining in its mouth, so tough that the thorns of a cactus can't break through the skin. Second, unlike most animals, a camel loses very little of his water in the form of sweat. The less water that is available to it, the less it sweats. Third, camels do not lose great amounts of moisture when they exhale. A camel's nose has a special mucus that helps to dehydrate or take water out of much of the moist air coming up from his lungs, recirculating the water throughout his body. Rather than losing great amounts of moisture when it exhales, a camel can conserve as much as 60% of its water. A final reason that camels can go several days without water in the summertime and several months without water in the wintertime is because they can drink so much of it when it does happen to be available. A thirsty camel can drink more than 20 gallons of water in only 10 minutes. Remarkably, a camel's stomach may be empty only a few minutes after taking in such a large amount of water. How can that be? Because the camel is designed with billions of small cells that store all of the water so the camel will have it at a later time when the water is scarce, such as when he's on a journey through the desert. While most humans and animals will become sick and die when losing only 10 to 15% of their body weight in the form of water, not camels, a camel's journey in the desert may be so long and dry that he can lose 25% of his body weight in water, yet still continue on his journey. Amazingly, the camel can keep going because of its well-designed capability 
to use large amounts of water, as much as 40% from its uniquely designed long oval blood cells. Friends, unintelligent, undirected evolution cannot logically explain the wondrous designs of the camel. The cool, comical, water-conserving camel is an amazing creature that testifies to an awesome creator. I really like that picture of camel too. That's a good one, right up, right up close. Um, so just as a side note, I thought it was interesting at the beginning of the video when he talked about uh, when he talked about an agitated camel spitting, and he referred to it's not actually spit, it's it's cud. Um, the first time I realized uh, this is uh, the first time I watched this video, I realized that uh, not everybody had the same upbringing as me because he took a second to explain what cud was. And as somebody who's uh, got family members that raise cattle, I was already very familiar with what cud is. I, that, that needed no explanation for me. Uh, I just thought that was kind of funny. Um, so there's something, uh, there's something that after the first video that I think I did not do a very good job of that I wanted to point out that the video does do a very good job. Um, they are, they, all, all of this whole series of videos does a good job of pointing out that uh, ever, all these qualities of the animals that they're talking about, all these things are designed that way. Um, and that's something that when I was talking about the giraffe's blood pressure there for uh, a minute ago, I, did, I said that it's amazing that the giraffe is able to regulate itself. Well, it's designed to be able to regulate itself. And I'm going to try and do a better job of emphasizing that is, uh, that's the point of what we're going after here is that all of this was designed uh, by an intelligent designer. <clears throat> um, so uh, it... I thought it was very interesting in, in watching this video that uh, uh, everything about this animal is the everything about camels. They're just so so well outfitted and designed for uh, resource bare environments. Um, you know, and and when you look at the three different species of camel, they live in uh, desert areas of Central Asia, the Middle East, and North Africa. And you know all all of these extremely uh, extremely you know uh, scarce environments, and it's just very interesting how well they're they're outfitted for that. Um, I the the last little bit that interested me uh, that I want that I did uh, just a touch bit more of research on was the uh, they talked about how the um, oblong oval shaped blood cells uh, do better in, in uh, in helping with the hydration, it uh, I think I think the way they phrased it was something like that. But I was uh, I was not a fan of um, their explanation. It doesn't actually the the oblong cells don't actually help with the hydration uh, keeping hydration itself. It's that oblong cells are uh, uh, oblong blood cells are make it easier to flow when the camel is dehydrated and uh, prevent uh, clots when there when there's not uh, when when the blood is thicker it's able to flow better um, so I thought that was very interesting uh, what other comments do we have about camels yes ma'am So, uh, so for those who couldn't hear, there, were, there was a, a two-part, and I'm going to address the second part first. It was asking the question, um, there, the, the video showed two, two different species of camel, uh, one in, located mostly in the Middle East, 
with one hump and the other one in Central Asia with two humps. And the question was, are they able to reproduce with each other? And man, I don't know. <laughs> That's that's what I tell that's what I tell my students in class when I don't know. It's, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I would be interested to find out myself. Um, you know the the idea being if if they have a common ancestor uh, through evolution, then perhaps they would be able to. But I don't know the answer to that. It would, yeah, uh, the, uh, the map says it would probably have about one and a half humps. That's right. <laughs> um, and the, the first part of your statement was, uh, was pointing out, uh, just for those who couldn't hear, that um, that's, a, that's a pretty common, that's a pretty well-known, uh, well-known incorrect fact that camels store water in their humps, and that's not true. Uh, it's, it's a fat storage. It is energy storage uh, for the animal. And that, thought that was pretty interesting as well that uh, it can so efficiently switch to burning the fat off of that when food is scarce. I wish I were that efficient myself. <laughs> Food's not scarce enough, that's what it is. <laughs> Alright, so our, uh, our next video, our last video, is about the thorny devil lizard. the thorny devil. You might wonder how the thorny devil got its name. Of course, the spikes on the lizard's skin look like thorns, so the thorny part's not hard to understand. But why is it called devil? In 1841, a man named John Gray named the lizard Moloch Horridus. Gray named the lizard after the Canaanite god Moloch because of the two horns that protrude out of the lizard's head. The term horridus, it can mean rough or spiky, or it can mean terrible or dreadful. While the thorny devil may look dreadful, it happens to be very easygoing and slow moving, and humans can handle it, and it doesn't become aggressive. Not only is the thorny devil very unique in the way that it looks, but God also equipped this little wonder with some amazing tools and skills. The thorny devil lives in the deserts of central Australia. And water is often very difficult to find. In order for the thorny devil to make the most of any water that it comes across, God specially designed the lizard's skin. Along the lizard's body, there are hundreds of tiny little channels, and they all lead to the corners of the lizard's mouth. When water touches the skin of a thorny devil, anywhere on its back, on its leg, on its foot, the tiny grooves suck up the water by using something called capillary action. Think about it like this. Suppose you spill a glass of water and use a paper towel to clean it up. When you dip the paper towel into the water, the water seeps up the towel to the parts that are not even touching the water. Also, it's like putting a wick in oil and the oil seeps up all the way through the wick, even the parts that aren't touching the oil. In the same way, the thorny devil sucks up water. So if the thorny devil wants to take a drink, it can simply step on water and then use a sucking motion and suck up the entire puddle and bring the water to its mouth with these tiny little channels. It never even has to put its mouth in the water. This ability keeps the lizard alive because any dew or moisture on plants or in the sand can be taken in this way without ever having to drink in what we would think of as a traditional way. You know, also, God gave the thorny devil several interesting ways to defend itself. Of course, the most obvious is that the thorny devil is covered with spiky skin and thorns. Just think, if you were a predator, would you want to eat something that looks like a pincushion full of sharp spikes? Well, I wouldn't either. Also, in addition to its spikes, the thorny devil has a false head on its neck just behind its real head. This false head is large and it's spiky, and when the thorny devil is threatened, it can lower its real head between its two front legs and raise its false head to look like its head. By doing this, it protects its important organs and makes its spiky head look much more difficult for a predator to swallow. You know, as, as if that weren't enough, 
The thorny devil can puff itself up by sucking in air so that it looks even bigger and more impressive to a predator and the pincushion just gets expanded. And maybe you were wondering what this prickly little critter eats. Mm, ants. And that's it. Ants all the time for every meal, every day. But it can sure eat a lot of them. A thorny devil finds a trail where ants are walking, then it positions itself along the trail so that it can stick out its sticky tongue and catch one ant at a time. Now it's so fast that it can catch 45 ants per minute, and some people say that it can eat 1,000 to 3,000 ants per meal. Now that is one ant-loving, bristly lizard. I'd hate to be an ant that came across the thorny devil's path. The thorny devil is a great example of God's amazing design. False ideas about mindless evolutionary processes, they can't ever explain the thorny devil's amazing skin and effective defense system. You know, only God could create such an interesting, ingeniously designed creature that can thrive in desert climates. The thorny devil is a big thorny problem for people who refuse to recognize God's design in nature. So I just got a note from, uh, from John, who uh, I'm sure is watching at home. It said that uh, the dromedary camel, which is the one hump, and the Bactrian camel, uh, two humps, can be crossbred, and the offspring are, uh, are it is, it, he said, the offspring produces a strong pack animal that's capable of withstanding rough terrain and colder, wetter climates which are good for trade and military conquest. However, they, uh, they do not naturally mate together. They're only done through, cross through uh, human-assisted crossbreeding. Uh, so that is pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah, he, he, uh, he, didn't, he didn't tell us how many humps that would have. Oh, well. <laughs> I don't know, you gotta remember I was a Texas A&M math major, so you know. <laughs> so uh, the thorny devil, uh, the lizard uh, found, found only in the desert climate in uh, central and western Australia, pretty interesting little animal. Um, it talked about a good bit about uh, how it gets water through capillary action. Um, capillary action, uh, and by the way, I'm about to tell you about 60% of what I learned in all of my high school science classes. Okay, so here goes. Um, capillary action is something that happens due to uh, cohesive forces, intermolecular forces of liquids, and, and especially, especially in water. Um, water molecules behave differently than a lot of other liquid molecules uh, together. And, and they stick together and you get what's called surface tension. And you can, you can see it when you like, you, you, fill up a little, you fill up a little container and you can make it brim up over the top of the container, right? That's because the water molecules stick together. That's uh, cohes cohesion within the molecules is what does that and creates surface tension. And so um, if you have a little channel or a little tube that's small enough, uh, water will flow through it completely on its own because of those intermolecular forces and the adhesion between the water and the little tube itself. And uh, the, the example they used was exactly the one that we used in my ninth grade science class where uh, you, could, you can dip a paper towel into water and the water s continues soaking up even past the little part that was actually under the water. Um, that, is, uh, that is capillary action. It happens in, there, there are lots of uh, porous and semi-porous materials where this, this happens in real life all the time. Um, however, in living beings, uh, this is not a very common occurrence. The, this lizard right here, as far as I could tell, is the only, uh, is one of the very few creatures where this, uh, this happens, where they've got little channels on their skin that direct water towards their mouth. Um, I, in, in the research I found there were a couple of 
snakes that do this also, and that was about it. Uh, and I just thought that was so fascinating, the way, the way this thing is designed to, to be able to just take moisture from the ground. They said most of, most of the water that a, a thorny devil lizard uses is from standing on damp sand in the morning. Like standing, stand, walking across dew in the morning is where it gets most of its water. And so I, that is just fascinating. Um, something I wanted to point out that was a little bit, oh, okay, John followed up. He said uh, the, the crossbreed of those two camels, uh, it has one elongated hump. So it's only one, but it's larger than the regular one hump camel. Okay. Man, we're just learning all sorts of new stuff today, aren't we? Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the, the first two animals that we talked about, the, the giraffe and the camel, are pretty unique sorts of things. Um, very unusual, even within the animal world. Uh, very unusual individual type of creatures. Um, however, the thorny devil has a, a, a couple of other breeds that are pretty similar to it. Uh, the most prominent one that we'd be familiar with would be the Texas horned lizard. Uh, or, you know, at least in Fort Worth, we'd be pretty familiar with the old horned frogs, right? Um, so, uh, you, the, you know, uh, y'all have seen, y'all can see the picture of this, and y'all have probably seen Texas horned frogs before. Um, the, these ones in Australia are certainly uh, more dangerous looking, I guess, just because of the spikes and all. Um, but largely pretty similar creatures. They're both, they're both not very large, and they both uh, subsist primarily on eating ants. And, uh, you know, the, the question comes into my mind, how is it that random mutation could have created such similar animals in completely different places in the world? Thorny devil lizards are exclusively located in the deserts in central and western Australia. Uh, horned lizards are found in the American Southwest, across Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, down in New Mexico. Um, it just it uh, again again it seems like a stretch of the of the definition of random to uh, to come up with the you know with such similar creatures in wildly different areas of the world. Uh, what else have you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's, it's just like a little formation of, it's mostly scales, isn't it? It's mostly just extra, like the, the hard stuff that makes up the scales and the spikes. It's an extra formation of one of those on top. You know, there's there's little subtle things, that, you know. <laughs> yeah, even if it is the same DNA. All right. Um, if y'all have nothing more to add about the thorny devil lizard, I'm going to turn it over to Travis, who's going to take over the rest of the class period, as far as I know. <laughs> yep. 
All right, well, class is going to run long, um, maybe by about five minutes. Just kidding, Doug, it'll be about 10. Um, so, all right, touching on, on something he brought up that these, the, you know, the horned lizard in, in Texas and, the, and the, that other one um, down in Australia, um, many, well, all evolutionists say that that is a, a reason to believe in evolution, that you see um, the same, same things in different animals throughout the whole thing. So we must have all had a common ancestor. But the thing is, is if you really look at it, um, you can make the argument that this actually um, presents the, the truth that there's actually a designer. Because we all live on the same earth, okay? And so if you <clears throat> look at it, we're all going to need some of the same similar designs to live in the environments that we do. Um, you'll notice uh, in, in real life, you look at designers of cars. And if you ever worked on, on cars, um, you'll notice some parts will fit on one brand of car and they'll also fit on another. And the reason why is because they've designed them to do the same exact thing. So when you really look at it, it's a good argument for maybe God knew what he was doing and designed them to all live on earth with pretty similar environments and, and, and parameters that we all have to live in. But anyways, <clears throat> um, the other thing we're going to be talking about is day six today. Or we've been talking about it for two weeks. Um, but we're, we're looking at humans. And so um, one of the things that they bring up is that uh, humans evolved from apes. And uh, they say that, well, we have 99.97, I think, is the, the, the number for how much similar DNA we have between us and the ape, but that, that 0.3% uh, of DNA um, is some huge, massive differences. It's not like it's 99.7 out of 100, so there's only three differences. It's out of billions and millions. It's huge amounts of differences in the DNA. Um, but they also say that the, the way that we come about um, these is we have found fossils that prove the, the evolutionary steps that we've needed to link humans to, um, to, to our evolution to humans from, from apes. And so we're going to look at that. Um, Doug, I'll give you a couple seconds to start the video. I want to let Jeff Miller explain this because he does it so well. Um, and he does it at about nine minutes. So we'll get that. And that will probably be the end of class. I'll have a couple comments after. But all right, Doug, you can run the video. You booked a sunny Verbo ski chalet uh, with on. endless <laughs> views of snow covered peaks. The following is a presentation of Apologetics Press. There you go. 1504 is where to start. This is a big giant video, it's six series. Six, the uh, area of alleged series. evidences for evolution that is proclaimed perhaps the loudest hey, Doug, among the evidences can you step ahead to is 1504? the fossil record. Does the fossil record indicate that humans evolved from an ape? Right there, that'll work. Here are a few of the bones that have been found over the years that prove how reckless the evolutionists have been in their clamor for evidence. Neanderthal man, very famous missing link fossils, supposed to be a missing link in the chain between ape-like creatures and humans. However, after examining the fossil remains of the famous skeleton, Dr. A.J.E. Cave proved that Neanderthal man was nothing more than an old man who suffered from arthritis. Dr. Cave noted that every Neanderthal child's skull that had been examined to that point apparently was affected by severe rickets. In children, it's common for rickets to produce a large head due to the late closure of the epiphysis and fontanelles. As Eric Trinkhaus, evolutionary anthropologist of Washington University in St. Louis, one of the world's foremost authorities on the Neanderthals, concluded, 
Detailed comparisons of Neanderthal skeletal remains with those of modern humans have shown that there is nothing in Neanderthal anatomy that conclusively indicates locomotor, manipulative, intellectual, or linguistic abilities inferior to those of modern humans. So it seems that Neanderthal man's anatomy essentially isn't distinguishable from modern human anatomy in any significant way. On top of that, modern human fossil remains have been found near the remains of Neanderthals that have been dated as older than the alleged dates of the Neanderthals. How could modern humans evolve from Neanderthals if Neanderthals date to a time after modern humans came along? In actuality, Neanderthal man is just a modern man, perhaps found a little deeper in the ground, but not proof of evolution. Back in 1891, evolutionists found fossilized teeth, the upper part of a skull, and a thigh bone on the banks of the Solo River in the Dutch Indies, and assumed they were from a transitional creature. From these few bones, evolutionists presumptuously drew what they thought the creature would have looked like, calling it Java Man. Wow, you mean you can take a few teeth, a bit of a skull, and a thigh bone and figure out what a person's anatomy looked like to this degree? No, you can't. But that doesn't stop the wild claims by many evolutionists. Over time, scientists found that the leg bone and teeth were actually from a human, and the skull cap was from a monkey. A few years after this find, while Java Man was still famous, in 1926, Professor Iberlein of the Dutch Medical Service he found what appeared to be a complete skull in the same area that Java Man had been discovered and seemingly like the alleged Java Man skull. Again, the fossil was hailed as more evidence of this transitional creature until time ran a retraction the next year. In 1927, in the retraction, the Smithsonian Institute said that the skull was actually the kneecap of an elephant. No transitional creature here. In 1912, a doctor found a jawbone and a portion of a skull in a gravel pit in England and assumed the fossils were from a transitional creature they called Piltdown Man. From those two items, evolutionists made a skull to show what they thought the transitional creature's head would have looked like. But in 1953, Piltdown Man was found to be a fake, a fraud. The skull fossil was found to be from a modern human. The jawbone was from an ape. In fact, the fossilized teeth had been changed on purpose, filed down by evolutionists, and treated chemically to make them look old. Definitely no transitional fossil here. In 1922, newspapers printed a picture of male and female human-like creatures that evolutionists had drawn based on, guess what? One fossil tooth they had found, which they claimed was from this prehistoric transitional creature. Once again, isn't it amazing what you could come up with about the physical form of a creature from one tooth? They called it Nebraska Man. Within five years, scientists had decided that the tooth was actually from a wild pig, not a transitional creature. The remains of Rhodesian man were found in a zinc mine in 1921 and displayed in the British Museum of Natural History for years. But the fossilized hips had been crushed, which caused the displayers to portray the creature as stooped over. Once again, years later, when actual anatomists examined the fossils, Rhodesian man was found to be merely a modern human being. Heidelberg man, named Homo heidelbergensis, was based off of a single lower jawbone. Pictured on the left on the screen compared to a regular modern-day human jawbone, Heidelberg man was recognized by the man that found him, Daniel Hartman, to be very human-like, and so he knew he belonged in the genus Homo. According to Donald Johansson, American paleoanthropologist and discoverer of the famous Lucy fossil, Hartman decided to give him a special name and put him in a species of his own in spite of its strong similarity to the human jawbone. Mr. Hartman, just because it's bigger, it doesn't mean it's not human. Wouldn't you like to see the wrestler Andre the Giant's jawbone or Goliath's jawbone up next to a normal-sized human jawbone? That may be exactly what we're seeing here. In 1979, what appeared to be a collarbone was found at a site named Sahabi in Libya, and some scientists believed it belonged to a primitive ape man. And after further investigation, the collarbone was found actually to be the fossilized rib of a sea mammal that was similar to a dolphin. You noticing how hard the evolutionists try to find foss transitional fossils? You'd think if transitional creatures ever existed, it wouldn't be so hard to find their remains. Then in the early 1980s, a portion of a skull, just a skull cap, was found near the Spanish village of Orsay, Evolutionists once again were quick to announce that the fragment was from an ancient human child. From that small fragment, 
They constructed an entire human they called Orsay Man. Later, the bone was conceded as likely being the skullcap of a six-month-old donkey. Handyman, or Homo habilis, is the creature that Lucy supposedly evolved into, a three-foot-tall ape. Once again, evolutionists will construct models and paintings without adequate evidence, grandiosely speculating and conjecturing. A fairly complete fossil skeleton of Handyman was discovered that indicated that this creature was simply an ape and in no way related to man at all. The skeleton of Handyman is just as primitive as Lucy, which is supposedly two million years older than Handyman. If evolution were true, in two million years worth of time, we should expect to see significant progress in evolving towards man. And yet Lucy is just as primitive as Handyman. No missing link here either. What about the elusive Peking man? In the 1920s and 30s, a few fossils were discovered near Beijing, China. Evolutionists were quick to call uh, the fossils transitional creatures and proof of evolution, dating the fossils from between 300,000 and 800,000 years ago using evolutionary dating techniques. But scientists have found conflicting evidence from the same site. In 1933, several fossils of modern humans were also discovered who weren't supposed to be on the scene yet. Bottom line, evolutionists will never know for sure because within a few years, in 1941, the, the fossils mysteriously went missing. Gao Zing, a paleontologist and member of the working committee to search for the lost skull caps of Peking man, he said, quote, we don't know where the bones are. They may well have been destroyed, but we have to look. Isn't it ironic that the more evolution is examined, the more its alleged evidence goes mysteriously missing? What about Cro-Magnon man? What's all the talk about this guy? Is he proof of evolution? Evolutionists claim that Cro-Magnons were the first creatures with a skeleton that they believe looked completely modern anatomically, just like us. Recent genetic research by a team of European geneticists from the universities of Ferrara and Florence showed that a Cro-Magnon man who lived in southern Italy, supposedly 28,000 years ago, was a modern European genetically as well. Okay, if they looked like us anatomically, and they were like us genetically, what's the difference? If it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, in this case, bleeds like a duck, it's a duck. No missing link here either. Cro-Magnon man is just a modern man. But you notice a pattern, quick claims that evidence has been found. Time passes, further study and investigation, retractions have to be made over and over again. You'd think more people would see the pattern and accept the truth. There's no evidence for evolution. But sadly, many people will believe what they want to believe, regardless of the evidence. The missing links between the alleged ape-like ancestor and human beings are not available. No wonder in their more candid moments, evolutionists admit as much. Colin Patterson right, was the paleontologist who served as the editor of the professional journal published by the British Museum of Natural History in London. He wrote a famous book about evolution, and a reader wrote him to ask why he made no reference. All right. So you can see, if you need to get up and, and walk, you can. We'll finish this up right here. Um, many of the, the claims that they have to, to the evolutional steps of, of men have been very easily disproven, even falsified to, to make it look like it. Um, and so I want to I focus on two points here real quick. Um, one is, if there ever were um, evolutionary stages in, in this development here. Um, we would definitely have fossils of it by now. Um, ask any, any uh, scientist and, and they'll tell you that while we don't have every fossil in the ground, our fossil accounts are pretty well accomplished. Um, we, we have millions of, of fossils. So if we have millions of fossils, we should have found um, at least something that was a, a a trait that was uh, evolving in the, in one of the stages, um, especially since it would have had to have lived around for a pretty long time if it takes millions of years to get to this. So there should have been more than just one. It, there had to have been, um, but but you don't see that. And the other thing that's kind of scary is that um, you'll still see many of these in the textbooks for kids, um, claiming that this is is still proof. Um, I don't know why, except for the fact that you have to, unless you're trying to deceive somebody. That's the only thing I can think of. Um, 
because uh, the only only reason you would still keep something in there. Um, I know there have been some that said, well, it's the best representation of, of what we think could have happened. Well, I'm sorry, it's still not proof that you actually had something that shouldn't be in there. Um, all right, any questions, comments? No? All righty, we'll get ready at 10. We'll start our main service. All right.
Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise proclaim, all his hosts together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them, Let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted. Far above the earth and sky. Let them praises give Jehovah. They were made at his command. Then forever he established. His decree shall never stand. From the earth, oh, praise Jehovah. All ye floods, ye dragons, all. Fire and hail and snow and vapor, stormy winds that hear him call. Let them, let them praise us, give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his, and his glory is exalted. And his, and his glory is exalted. And his, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. Good morning, Bridgewood. How's everybody doing? It's great to see you all here, um, especially after that scary weather we had last week. Or, yeah, last week. Um, getting snowed in. Yay, fun stuff. Um, well, if you missed class, uh, you missed pretty good stuff. I, I, I enjoyed it a lot. And uh, so I'll give you a little short fact later on towards announcements, but uh, we're glad you're here. Um, fill out an attendance card if you can. That way we have those when we, we go around, um, and we'll pick those up during service. All right, Daniel, you're on. Good morning. If you're using the songbook, we'll be starting in song number 531 this morning. Number 531. <clears throat> 
uh, that song that was just playing a minute ago, the Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. Um, I said a while back when I led that song one day that uh, a lot of the lyrics are taken pretty much directly from Psalm 148. Um, this song right here is another one of those. It's uh, very much involved with, with Psalm 148. So if you have the opportunity, give that a read through and then compare it to the words of these songs that you've heard for however many years. It's, uh, it's really very interesting how you can uh, take those songs that were written you know, thousands of years ago and translate them into English and have even more songs. It's just more of the same thing. So uh, we're going to sing the first, second, and last verse of number 531. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Sun and moon rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, amen. Seven fifty six, number seven five six, and we'll sing the first, second, and last verse. <clears throat>
Will you bow with me, please, as we pray? Father, what a thrill it is to be together with our family again today and to be together in your presence together, Lord, to worship you, to glorify you, to sing praises to you, to hear your word and to give in your service. Lord, we, we are weak, but we know that you are strong. We lack a lot, but we know you know everything. Father, there are many of our family that are having troubles, illness, and different sorts of problems. And we ask, Lord, that you give us all strength to serve one another and, and help all of those that they might get well, Lord. We need everyone. Lord, help us to learn your word today and help us to apply it as we go through life day by day. And help us to teach others the love that you have for us. And Father, we pray for our nation. Oh, Lord, we're in need. We ask your guidance on our government, on us as people, and on the whole world, as the world is in great turmoil, Lord. We know that you're the anchor, and we know that you're the solution. And Father, help us to teach others that there is hope and that hope lies because of you, your son, and your spirit, Lord. We thank you for the many wonderful blessings. And Lord, we thank you for this congregation. Our prayer is that we will continue to learn more, to teach more, and to love more. And express the light of your love to the whole world. Starting right here in Fort Worth. Help us to serve you every day with everything that we do, Lord. And forgive us as we are weak and we fail many times. But we know that your strength will sustain us. All we've got to do is turn to you. Lord, we ask these many blessings uh, today. And we ask that you watch over John as he's healing over this terrible problem that we have in the world. Help us all to serve you always. And Lord, we ask these many things in Jesus' name. Amen. Next song will be number 571. Number 571. And we'll sing the first and last verse of this song. <clears throat> Sinking the lost, yes, come me in trees. song will be number 226 number 226 after this song we'll have our scripture reading and then the message brought to us this morning by carol harris jr <clears throat> Oh! 
I'll be reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no man according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. Yet now we know him, thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new, new things have come. Now all these things are from God. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, God, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against, against them, and he has committed us to us the world of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were entreating through us. We beg, we beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Good morning. It's great to see everyone here this morning. I'm not supposed to be here this morning, but maybe I am. Uh, John wasn't able to be with us this morning because it finally caught him. We can run, it seems, and we can run, and we can do everything right, and this thing still catches us. So uh, um, I know of a couple people who have not been caught yet, so who knows how all this works? Who knows how all this works? We have lots of questions about everything that's going on. I certainly do. But I'm glad to be here this morning. And I want to say that I also have very much enjoyed our study of creation. And uh, we're getting into chapter 2 this morning of Genesis. So we're going to be in chapter 2 of Genesis. And as Riley just read for us, thank you, Riley, uh, we're going to be in um, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. So those are the two main places that I'm going to dip into for our lesson this morning. So as we contemplate the creation and all that God has made in, his, in the heavens and on the earth, many people would say the universe, right? That word is not actually in the Bible, okay? So I, I'm not trying to be overly particular, but I want to get across the idea that faith comes by the word of God and nothing else, right? So everything that we see, everything that we explained, all the words that we hear, if they're not from God, they need to be tested. They need to be put in their place as something outside that which builds faith, okay? Evidence can compound, and, and we talk about evidence all the time, but the Word of God is the only thing that can build faith in us. Not what man can know, because we certainly are mistaken sometimes. So as we have that in our mind, let us, conter- let us continue our journey uh, in the study of the beginning. We should take caution uh, with how we view the universe and God's creation. It's holy. It's set apart. It was spoken by the living God. Hebrews 11, 1 through 3 says this, and I'm going to mix up a couple versions, okay? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. For by it, the elders or the, the, uh, the ancestors of old obtained a good report. Okay, that's the King James part of it, Okay. By faith, we understand that um, the world has been created by the word of God, okay? And uh, so that what is seen has not been uh, made by the visible, okay? It takes a little bit to take that in, okay? What is seen has not been made by the visible. So how was it made? What was invisible that made everything visible? The word of God. The Word of God is what we're, we're, we're talking about. Sometimes we think the Word of God, it's, it's the words in black and white in our Bible. It's more powerful than that. The Word of God goes out into everything and changes it to His design and according to His pattern. So as we study the creation, let us connect the creation uh, with ourselves and let us put creation into the right perspective every single time because there's a lot of things that are against us so we can say by faith that on day one God created the heavens and the earth and it seems the description seems like a very primitive earth and uh, water is involved in its elemental form and God moved or hovered 
over the surface of the waters. Okay? We know that verse, don't we? Okay? That word hovering over the water has the connotation of brooding over, like a mother bird would for her chicks. Isn't that interesting? God was caring from the very beginning with this very elemental, unformed world over the surface of the waters. That's what we can understand by faith. On day one, God also spoke light into existence. He spoke it into, the, into existence. That's an amazing thing. He created day and night. Day two, God separated the water from above from the waters below. And he created the expanse or the firmament between the waters. And he called this heaven. He created the atmosphere and the tent of the earth and the heavens. I hear water dripping. I don't know, Travis? <laughs> Can't do anything about it now, but um, if you're up here that you can hear it. Um, on day three, we see that God separated the seas from the dry land and said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants, and trees. God's voice, the word of God was directed at what? The land, and it sprouted forth trees and vegetation and everything that we know from the earth that is the, in the plant kingdom. Day four, God set the lights in the firmament above. He created the stars and the moon and the sun. And if you pay attention to so-called science, this is one of the biggest contentions that there has to be. Because without the word of God, man may think that there was a, a, a godless big bang and everything came into being and was created by an explosion. Usually, explosions do the opposite. They destruct, okay? They take down. So be careful with anything that science tells us, especially if it goes against this. No matter how simple it may be, be careful with what you hear because it is not of faith. Day five, God said to the waters, his voice to the waters in the world, to bring forth living creatures, and the seas were filled, they were teeming uh, with creatures, and also the birds of the air. That was done by the very word of God. On day six, we know that God created the animals. He did it in a similar way. Uh, day six, in uh, Genesis 1.26, God says, let us, let us make mankind in our, in our image, and according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and, other, and, other, and over every crawling thing that crawls upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which is fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you and to every animal of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the ground which have life. I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. That's also a contradiction, a clear contradiction of what we would learn from science. Oh, there's no way that animals relied on green plants for food. And God saw that all he had made, and behold, it wasn't just good. It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. This is the word of God affecting from day one to day six everything that we know. Everything that we know was created by his word. In chapter two, verse seven, the Lord formed man, it says. So we talked about chapter two. It's like an appendix to chapter one, telling a little bit more of the story uh, that's, that's uh, from Moses' perspective, it seems, uh, to relate to uh, the, whoever reads it, including us. Uh, chapter 2, verse 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living person, or it can be understood, a living soul, okay? In the nature of, or in the likeness of God himself. Do you realize that when God created Adam, he created an immortal creature, 
an immortal being like himself? In fact, we are all immortal. We all die, but we all live forever. That's the way that God made us. When our breath leaves, our soul goes with it. That's a fact. When our breath leaves, our soul goes with that breath. And that will be back to God. Our enemy is death itself. There's no doubt. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 through 25, the Lord says this. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to, Garden of Eden, to cultivate it and tend to it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. God had one law for man. And we can say to Adam, Adam, you had one job. You had one job. You had one rule. And you were living in paradise on earth. You were living in heaven on earth. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. And out of the ground, the Lord formed every animal of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living, a living creature, that was his name. The man gave name to all the livestock, all the birds of the sky and to every animal of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And he took out one of the ribs and closed the flesh in that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, at last, this is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Truly, every human that has ever existed came from Adam, and only Adam, even though all the children of Eve uh, came from her. She's the mother of all living, as we'll get to in the next weeks, Lord willing. All men are from Adam. This is a very important fact. He is the standard. He is the original genetic makeup of all mankind. That's how God made us. Everyone in here, everyone in here, the whole spectrum of people that we have ever met, the whole spectrum of people that have walked on the earth. People are this tall and this tall. And taller than that in the past even. Everyone has come from Adam. And that's a fact that we take by faith. And we have to apply it. Okay? Hopefully we will this morning. For this, And then, then Moses says this. He jumps into the future because the only father that Adam knew was Father God. Right? He says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. This is teaching us something. This is put perfectly in context. There wasn't a wedding, there wasn't a white dress, there wasn't any dress, right? That's what it says. God made them male and female for a specific purpose. Okay? Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness. And we can understand we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's in Psalms 139, 14. The narrative today, that is the word of man, the word of men, mortal men, mortal men, counters what God has uh, uh, made by his word. It is an all-out attack on God and on our minds we're not immune to it whatsoever. Churches have been tainted. People of great faith have been tainted into compromising the word of God with the word of man. And we don't even know that we're doing it sometimes. Looking back, we can see a coordinated plan. Even in our lifetimes, there's no doubt. To distort and destroy the true light of God's word regarding the heavens and the earth. Not just the sun and the moon and the stars, but the nature of man. And we also know from the Bible, there is nothing new under the sun. This has been going on since the beginning. Let me give you a brief rundown from what I see. Some people have written this better, but let me give you mine. People want to remove God from society and replace with man's governance. We have removed dependence on God and replaced dependence on government. 
We've removed dependence on family and replaced it with government. We have defined the family as merely a construct of man. Okay, Evolutionary process, it was best to have a family, and so the best way of survival and not get killed was to be in a family. Okay, That's what they say. That's not what God says. This is evolutionary theory in practice. It's kind of a soft practice that we may not see. Remove the moral uh, reproductive restrictions away from a husband and wife. Okay. Require tolerance, but require no standard of behavior. You get that? You require tolerance, but no standard of behavior. Remove any distinction in marriage. I'm going down a list here, a progression. Remove any distinction of marriage, that is, same-sex marriage, even here. Within our lifetime, homosexual practice has gone from a punishment, a crime punishment, to uh, allowed and even encouraged. Redefine the family uh, to man's model. That means just about anything can be called a family. Redefine gender distinctions away from physical gender defined by our chromosomes. Okay, we're going to be hearing a lot about, with, about this with sports and Olympics. It's just preposterous. Man's teaching this. Move from individual, to, uh, individual tolerance to enforcement of behavior by requiring acceptance. You see the shift? You don't have to just tolerate it. You have to accept it. And if you don't accept it, there will be punishment. One day it will be criminal. There's no doubt. Remove the distinction between animals and mankind. A dog, a child. They're equal in some men's mind. Remove all distinction from men and women. There's more, but I'm going to stop there. You get the idea. You get the idea of the teaching of man. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and see if we can make application. You know, this, this chapter speaks very well uh, to those who have suffered loss, who are suffering loss, who are contemplating the loss of their earthly life, but it reminds us of our own immortality. Let me go through this. Bear with me as we go through this entire chapter, because I think it is very important to connect the creation to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because it makes such a difference and it's the focus of our lesson which is the new or the creation of a new man. Okay. Chapter 5 verse 1. For we know that if our earthly tent which is our house is torn down we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For indeed, in this tent we groan longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, since in fact since, in fact, we are putting it on, and we will not be found naked. For, indeed, when we are in this, uh, in this tent, we groan, being burdened, because we do not want to be unclothed, but to be clothed. And what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. Now, he who prepared us for this very purpose is God, who gave us the Spirit as his pledge. And to understand a little bit more about the Spirit in context, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 21 and 22, it, uh, Paul says, Now he who established us with you in Christ, he who established us with you in, with you in Christ, has appointed us, uh, who, and appointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as his pledge. That's what he gave us, and that's what Paul is uh, talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 5. He gave us his spirit as a pledge. Verse 6, Therefore, being always of good courage, and knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. But we are of good courage, and prefer rather to be absent from the body, and to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have as our ambition whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. For we must all appear, all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive uh, compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with that what he has done, whether good or bad. We all must appear before the judgment seat. All of us immortal people 
during our mortal lives, when that's gone, we have to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So we've got to get ready. We've got to get ready. Also in verse 6, it talks about absence from the Lord. Don't you think the longing of our souls, when we truly reflect on it, want to be in a place like the Garden of Eden? Don't we want to have per- perfection and not have to deal with COVID, not have to deal with being sick, not have to be dealing with death and destruction? And like I told Stephanie, I want to pet a lion. <laughs> the big mane of a lion. Wouldn't that be cool? If I tried that at the Fort Worth Zoo, I would probably lose my arm, wouldn't I? It's interesting to think about. Okay, let's press on. You see, our bad deeds done in the flesh condemn us. Just as in all men of Adam, the beginning of all flesh of all men, Adam and Eve, we have had this problem from the very beginning. Is Adam going to be in front of the judgment seat of Christ? Yes, he will. All of us, all of mankind. Verse 11, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade people. But we are uh, well known to God, and I hope that we are also well known to your consciences, in your consciences. We are not commending ourselves uh, to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to be proud of us, so that you will have an answer to those who take pride in appearance and not in heart. For if we have lost our minds, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us. Having uh, concluded this, having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all, so that those who would live no longer would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose on their behalf. As we reflect on creation, we can know this. All mankind came through Adam. And all men who have life that live for themselves now will die. If you have life and you're living for yourself now, you will die. All living men that are of the Spirit are not living for themselves because they are living through Christ, having died to themselves. Church, we know this is a requirement, don't we? to die to ourselves, and we have to practice it. Because a living sacrifice tends to get up off the altar and wants to go do their own thing instead of laying our life down. If we are living through Christ, we have died for ourselves, died to ourselves. Only during the span of our lives do we have the opportunity that Christ gives us. Only in the short span of our lives do we have an opportunity to change? We can't change before we were born. We can't change after we have died. It is only during this life. We never know when that's going to end, do we? Only during our lives on this earth can immortal beings make eternal choices. Only during our lives can we immortal beings influence others for good or bad towards heaven or hell. Have you thought of that? When you sit across from your family, as we sit here in this congregation and we contemplate our friends and and all those that we're around, do you look at other people and say, that is an immortal being. And while I'm on this earth, I have the chance to do something. And everything that I say and every example that I give, I'm influencing that immortal being to a life in heaven or condemnation in hell to follow it's a heavy burden that we carry as immortal as immortal people as immortal creatures as immortal beings verse 16 therefore from now on we recognize no one by the flesh even though we have known christ by the flesh yet we now know him in this way no longer therefore if anyone is in christ in christ This person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We can be like Adam in the garden. Sinless, unashamed by being in Christ. Not of our own goodness, our own good deeds done in the flesh. But it is a gift from God. Paid for 
by the blood of Christ. We can return to that short picture that we have in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 of Adam and Eve in the garden. Sinless. They didn't break any laws. They were immortal. They had everything. We can return to that state through Jesus Christ. That's part of the creation story. And it is the creation story of each one of us who are Christians. It's a big thing. It's a heavy thing. But it's a beautiful thing. Verse 18. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Do you know that we have to be reconciled? We have to be brought back. We have to be brought back. We were estranged by sin, but we can be reconciled. Christ gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their wrongdoings against them, and he has committed us to the word of reconciliation. So not only are you reconciled, but you have a job to do. You have a job to do. It is to bring that message that you have received that is no doing of your own to other people. That's the ministry of reconciliation. We tell others who are outside of Christ how to be reconciled to Christ. Oh, it's not just undoing. It's God forgiving. It's Sin's not held against us. When I do things, sometimes things are held against me. Sometimes they're not, and I'm forgiven. That's a wonderful thing. It makes you humble. It doesn't make you prideful. It makes you humble. humble. So, we are to reproduce after our own kind. Right? Like the garden. And what is that? To be in Christ. To be reconciled to Christ. To be a new creature. We are to re- reproduce that in kind in a spiritual sense verse 20 therefore we are ambassadors for christ as though god were making an appeal through us we beg you on on behalf of christ be reconciled to god he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of god in him do you hear in him do you hear in christ We must hear this. So as we finish the lesson this morning, connecting creation with your own life, whether you're a Christian here and you haven't been an ambassador, been the ambassador that you should have been, not thinking about the reconciliation, not thinking about the forgiveness that you've received in Christ. If you're outside of Christ, having not yet met him and been added to him in baptism, We're making an appeal this morning. I'm making an appeal to you. In Christ, there's only one way to be in Christ. And all true Christians have the spirit of Christ in them. The only way to be in Christ is to be be baptized into him. How does that connect to the, the creation story? The water, the world was born out of water, was it not? From the very beginning. In class we went through all the episodes involving water. And they're all about crossing through. Being saved from. Making a transition out of and into something more. It's an amazing thing. God has connected the birth of the world to the new birth of you individually in his creation through water. The way into baptism is by dying to self through repentance. It is required to turn away from yourselves and turn to God. The way to repentance is acknowledging who Christ is and confessing him before men. These are requirements. They show that you are not living for yourself, but you want to be in Christ. The way to recognizing uh, recognizing Christ is through belief in his word. This is the same word that created all of creation. All the stars in the sky, the sun and the moon making their regular path. God's word made those. Everything that you see 
is related to that creation. And when you're in Christ, it's related to you. God would have come and died if it was just Adam. He would have reconciled Adam because he loved mankind that much. Today, I'm acting as an ambassador and beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's our duty every day. That's my privilege this morning in speaking to you. But realize that you are a new creation, born by the word of God in faith and through water. It's a very simple but a very complex arrangement that we live in. If you want to study, if you want to set yourself right, if you want to learn and grow as the, the creature, the new creation that you are, we ask you to come while we offer this invitation, especially, especially if you need to be added to him. Let us sing. God is calling the prodigal Good morning, everyone. Hope you have a great week. The early church was not left without teaching about the memorial to Christ's death. Paul taught, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. 1 Corinthians 11, 23-26 Thus the church at Corinth received a detailed account of how the supper was begun and its true significance. They were to remember the death of Jesus Christ and be strengthened to give their lives for the cause of which he had died. They derived spiritual food from the supper. The memorial to the death of Christ should be sacred to everyone. Yet there were those in Corinth who perverted this memorial feast. Their sinful behavior had just been pointed out by the apostles in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22. The rich among them were feasting before the supper, even to getting drunk, 
while the poor were still hungry? How could they offer up spiritual sacrifice unto God? Their attitude was condemned. As Paul continued, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 29. Keep in mind that this has to do with the manner of partaking, not whether or not one is worthy. There is none worthy to sit at the table with Jesus, but those, un, but though unworthy, he may yet eat and drink worthily by properly discerning the Lord's body and blood, and thus be spiritually blessed. A Christian leaves the Lord's Supper with renewed spiritual strength, gained by his newness to Christ, the fellowship of the saints, and due homage paid to our Lord and Savior. The eyes of faith see him in his honor of agony as we commemorate his sacrifice made for us. This spiritual strength comes not from the literal bread and fruit of the vine, but from the memory of what they symbolize. This renewal of our dedication helps keep us steadfast in his service. Let's pray for the bread. Gracious God, we're so thankful for this day, so thankful for your wonderful love and your grace. We know that we're not worthy to sit at your table, but we can do it in a worthy manner according to your plan. Be with us as we uh, want to remember Jesus as he got up on that cross and gave his life for us and sacrificed everything so that we may have eternal life with you. Be with us now as we partake of this bread, as we uh, take it in a worthy manner that is well pleased in your sight. In Christ's precious name, amen. Shall we pray? Dear God, as we continue this memorial service this morning, pray that we clear our minds, focus on your son and his death, his burial, and his wonderful resurrection. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, help us to remember the blood that was shed for us on the cross, and hopefully we partake of it in a worthy manner. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Father in heaven, at this time, we have the opportunity to return a portion of the wealth and prosperity that you have given to us. Father, may we do it with open heart and in thankfulness for all that you've done for us. Father, we thank you for this. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Next song is going to be number 495. <clears throat> number 495. We'll sing the first and last verse of this song. <clears throat> After the song, we'll have our closing prayer, and then our closing hymn and announcements. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day and thank you for all the blessings that you give us. Lord, we ask that you be with us this day as we worship you, that we can reflect on the things that we've learned and apply them to our lives and share them with others that we know. Lord, we ask that you be with those that are on our sick list, that they will uh, regain their health if it be your will. Lord, we ask that you uh, be with the elders of this congregation and the teachers that uh, they will have wisdom and, and guidance from you and, and that we can uh, teach the things that, that need to be taught. And Lord, we ask that you also help us to uh, be able to reach out in this community around us and, and uh, spread the word to them. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn, we're going to sing number 551. Number 551. We'll sing the first and last verse. <clears throat> Rescue the perishing, care for the
And I'm back. You just thought you got rid of me. All right. So before we get into announcements, um, one thing I learned from Bible class, um, and Daniel brought this up that I didn't know. You know, the humps on the back of the camels. I always thought that was, you know, where they stored their water. Um, apparently it's not. Um, that's actually where the, the fat storage is. Um, so that's pretty incredible. And then also, if you missed class, we went over the, um, uh, the lies of evolution um, and, and how we, we haven't come from, from apes. So it was a good class, really enjoyed it, um, and, and this has just been a good series, actually. So, all right. So for announcements, uh, Chris Fry, Fry would really appreciate our prayers um, as he's recovering from knee surgery. Um, also, that just came up on the screen, and that reminded me, if you haven't filled out that visitor's card, fill that out or check in with the QR code up there. Um, so Chris Fry is uh, recovering from knee surgery, so keep him in your, in your prayers. Um, and then also uh, Eva Smith um, had some, some issues with her blood pressure this morning um, and fell and hit her head. She'll be going to the doctor Monday um, to get checked out, but keep her in your prayers that everything works out and it's, it's nothing huge. Um, also, uh, Marion Tyler, she's probably watching online right now. Um, our uh, sympathy is extended to her and her family um, on the death of her nephew, Billy Butler, and uh, wife, Jennifer. Um, so keep them in your prayers. Also, there's additional prayer requests in the, the, the beacon, so look those up and, and continue to be praying for those things. Um, also, 39ers, the price is right. Come on down this Saturday and join us for annual sweethearts dinner. Uh, sign up sheet is in the foyer. Today is the last day to sign up. If you don't sign up, it's over. It's just over. We're not going to let you in. Now, if you forget to sign up, call Brianne. But please, get out there after worship today and sign up um, for that. Um, also, this one's a long one. A community gardening event will be held at the Bridgewood Building on Saturday, February 26th from 2 to 6 p.m. This will be the official launch of the 2022 growing season for the Together We Grow Garden. We're excited to have Robert uh, uh, Ferris, a certified Fort Worth Master Gardener, and Lauren Hickman, a uh, program coordinator from Tarrant Area Food Bank, uh, speaking at the event. Um, they will share tips for success in backyard or community gardening and be available to answer your questions. Um, there will be demonstrations and some hands-on learning um, there will even be a few giveaways. Oh, that sounds fun. Now I might show up. Um, this is a family-friendly event. Um, if you have any questions, ask Robert Griffin. Uh, this gardening event is a, a great opportunity to invite friends, so do that. Um, Robert will be here tonight, so you can ask him then. Don't go running around right now looking for him. He's not here. He's at work, so you won't find him. And then also, hostesses for Stephanie and Nalu's uh, baby shower. Um, if you could, please meet down front for a short meeting after service. So just meet down right here, um, and you'll have that short meeting. All right. That's all I have. Hope to see you back tonight. Um, yeah, you're dismissed.